Hey Blenders, it's Sean and I am introducing a bonus episode of The Real Blend Podcast because we have a very cool interview that we were able to do on the side. Uh, it's with Janixa Bravo, who's a screenwriter and director of a film called Zola that made a big splash at the Sundance Film Festival in 2020 and is now going to be making its way to theaters uh, at the end of this month. And so we reached out and were able to get her as part of the press day because this story um, is insane. I want you guys to be able to put this on your radar and go seek it out as quickly as you can. It's based um, pretty pretty closely, like not loosely, but very accurately on a Twitter feed story that this one girl told about a trip that she went on from Ohio to Florida with a girl that she just met. And it's about the different troubles that they get into. And the the uh, the movie introduces a newcomer named Taylor Page, who plays the girl from uh, Ohio, who is going down to Florida with a, a girl played by, by Riley Keough. And, you know, it's about um, strip dancers and it's about drugs. But then it gets into so much more than that, um, including... Uh, um, human trafficking and prostitution and some wild, wild topics. But the tone of it... Uh, as I think really, really important. And, and one of the reasons why Zola is connecting uh, so largely with critics and now audiences as people get to see it. So we wanted to talk to uh, Miss Bravo and really get into her process. Uh, it, it takes advantage of some of the visual and audio aspects that we know from social media and really applies them to this story. And I think it's really just the announcement of an exciting storyteller. So without further ado, a bonus episode of Real Blend, our interview with Janixa Bravo. Uh, Janixa, my name is Jake. That's Sean. We're the Real Blend podcast, and so we tend to do sort of deep dives into filmmaking. We both love this movie, and and we want to ask kind of fun, nerdy questions that oftentimes we don't get to ask uh, in a in a TV junket interview. So, so, so thank you for taking the time to chat with us. For having me. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. You know, uh, what's what's interesting about this story is it, is it has the potential to almost be Rashomon like because just about everyone involved has different theories or different uh, stories about what happened that weekend in Florida. I'm sort of curious as to how much stock you, I know there is sort of the aside that Stephanie gets to tell her story briefly, but how much stock did you take into other people's accounts for that weekend outside of Zola's? Uh, you know, when I started researching the film, I, it was part of my dramaturgy. I'm a theater student. I went to theater school. I didn't go to film school. So Everything that I'm working on, even when I'm working in television, I, I come to it with a good amount of dramaturgy just so that I can get in the ecosystem of the thing that I'm building. And so with this, I, I did seek out other accounts. I found the real Stephanie told her version on Reddit, the real Derek, uh, paid by Nick Braun, he told his version on Facebook. And when you held all three of those together when you had held the Twitter story, the Reddit version, and the Facebook version all next to each other, they were pretty symbiotic. The one thing that was different is that each person who told it not only cast themselves as the main character, but they recast their personality a little bit different so that they each had their own agency and that they were in a position of power or in the alpha seat where everyone else around them was sort of the beta, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. Uh, Janixa, one of the tools that you use is narration, and you choose to use it very specifically, and I think it works to tremendous effect. Um, a lot of times other movies try to use it and it's overkill or over-explanation. You use it to a place where it gives pers- uh, specific insight into how uh, Zola in particular is feeling at that time. Can you just talk about when you chose to, to punch it in and why you wanted to, to use it to that effect? Absolutely. So the uh, the narration had been written into the script actually mm-hmm. and then when i had done my first pass my my director's pass at it i had not included any of the narration one i didn't have it you know we hadn't recorded it on set and uh and i kind of wanted to see if the movie could live without it i have my own kind of allergic reaction to narration not to say that i don't love it i think there are certain films where it really works, right? Yeah. And then there are others where it feels like the work is relying on something that is missing. And mm-hmm. so, you know, when I think of, well, what's my, one of my favorite movies that uses narration would be Uthuma Tambien. And it does this really beautiful job of highlighting the world, highlighting tapestry. It isn't necessarily even what's happening in the scene. In fact, most of that narration is used as world building, just the thing that's happening right next to them. Um, and so I, I didn't include it in that verse in my director's pass. I shared it with everyone. 
and all of our producers and, you know, the main note was like, well, where's the narration? I was like, I don't know. I'm not really sure about that. And, and I did another pass and I did another pass. And ultimately everyone just kind of wanted to see a version that had the narration in it. And it also required rewriting uh, because now that we had a physical movie in front of us, some of what had been written didn't necessarily work. And not only that, I, I had to kind of decide what I wanted the narration to serve in our film. I think the movie is in some ways a classic comedy. And by that, I mean, Taylor Page, who plays Zola, is your classic straight man. And Riley Keough, who plays Stephanie, is the clown or the buffoon. You know, she is menace, right? And, and so how is narration going to be used in this world? Because... Zola Taylor is telling us the story. She is often actually pretty silent, right? Or she's like rather subdued. She is right next to all of the action. And so the narration then became a tool to access her in the moment gut. What is her in the moment gut trying to say about the thing that we are watching? Mm. Uh, you know, I was going to bring this question up later because it's kind of a heavy question and I didn't know sort of where to fit into the conversation. But you bring up the idea that sort of this, that the classic comedy tone and the tone of this film is so interesting because there are moments that I audibly laughed out loud watching this film because it, it can get just so incredible and, and where you just you, you just can't believe what's happening in front of you. But there's also this underlying idea of, of, of sex trafficking and how much of a real issue that is in our country and what's going on in the world right now. So I'm just sort of curious as a filmmaker, how you found that right tone to sort of like, yes, like this is a ridiculous story and you could have fun with it and there are aspects of the story you can laugh at. But also there are a lot of aspects in, in, in particular with, with one character who like, it's not, it's no joke what this guy was doing in a lot of ways. Absolutely. I, I think that's why, why I felt it was right for me or that's why I wanted it. I think on paper, I'd find myself while I was working on it, many people would ask me, well, what's the movie about? And I was like, oh, it's a it's a dark comedy um, about, uh, you know, these two women become fast friends and they go on a road trip. And then one finds out she's being sold into sex slavery. But it is uh, it is a dark comedy. And, you know, the person on the other end of that information um, did not really think that was funny and didn't understand why it was funny. And I'm like, no, no, you kind of you have to read the source material. You'll see what I mean. And and so much of that humor is embedded into the source material. It happens to be on par with my own sensibility. You know, if I were to define my, my comedy, I think of myself as a comedy director. And if you were to ask me to define my, my style, I would say it was stressful comedy. I believe that is my lane or my genre. Uh, I think that humor is such a great place and a great way for us to be having this conversation also about sex work, right? Or to highlight sex trafficking, which is rather bleak. There is a version of this movie that is a bit heavier, more morose. And I think the experience of that film is something that the audience can walk away from feeling like the world is so far away from them. Because this movie is funny, I think that the comedy actually brings you closer. I think you feel as though you're being invited or given a front row seat into something that you haven't really had to consider. And the humor around it isn't laughing at it. Uh, the humor around it is laughing with the ridiculousness of just being alive and the pain of being alive and how uncomfortable just like trying to get through like the everyday is. I mean, those girls could be the girls that live next door. This could happen to women that we know. This could happen to people that we know. And I, I hope what the movie does is that it gives it a name and it gives it a face and it allows for a conversation around uh, a really tricky and unfortunate subject. Yeah, absolutely. Like I Thank absolutely that. did that because, yeah, there were times when I thought it, it could have gone really broad and it never did. It always stayed in this realistic territory, which made it, made it all the more terrifying in some aspects. Um, I love that you mentioned your style because um, I kind of wanted to get into the topic of... You rely on social media a lot um, for the movie, but visually as well, too, there are some influences uh, in terms of how certain things are presented. And, you know, we're a society that's looking at social media constantly. You know, we're, we're zipping through uh, TikTok and we're on Instagram and, and people are using their cameras all the time every single day. And I'm wondering what kind of influence that has on you as a filmmaker in terms of 
how you might compose your shot or where where you think of your camera placement. There was one scene in particular where the, the road trip is just getting started and everybody's into the, the party atmosphere. And I was like, oh, this would I almost look like this looks like I'm watching someone's social media channel, you know, uh, and you take advantage of that. And I was wondering as a director how how you sort of use that to make some decisions. I mean, I think for for this film, um, the Internet was very necessary. This movie, I think, is also a love letter to the Internet. Um, mm. It's a story born out of the Internet. It is born out of Twitter. And the audience that flocked to it on Twitter is why the three of us are in this chat right mm. now. Um, uh, there are definitely some gestures that speak to social media in the film. I don't know that those would be applied anywhere else for me because I think in my other work, I, I always try to meet the work at the, at the house it is trying to build. Right. And the, the house that this is building is like internet 2015, you know, mm -hmm. Vine 2015, like there's Vine in the movie. There's a, you know, someone's got a GoPro in their book bag. The senior talking about Nick Braun's character, Derek happens to have a GoPro in his camera and how we got to that. I mean, you know, the movie shot on 16, we wanted to shoot that moment on 16, but it just was implausible. The, it meant the actors shooting themselves. How are they going to pull focus? And we were kind of thinking of like, how do we do this? How do we create this moment? And I just, the two ideas that I had that I was like, I don't exactly know. One was, can we, should we shoot it on a GoPro? Like, is that possible? Is that going to feel good in our world? And then the other was, we tried this 360 degree camera actually. And that footage just was like, yuck. So that's not in the movie. <laughs> um, it was a down vote, you guys. But we were, I was speaking so much to what was in at the time. I, I did treat it a little bit like a period piece, right? It is 2015. Even the music is 2015 and earlier. Um, so I tried to stay within the confines of that year or what came before it. That's, That's crazy. crazy. I didn't even that, think of the music from yeah, that perspective. The, the yeah. world has changed so much that that six years ago can be a period piece. Like that's that's just that's like that's that's just that's insane. <laughs> that's no a, well, speaking of so it's, oh, it's true. It's absolutely true. I don't know if you Pin Fifteen was like it's like set in the early two thousands, and I don't know if you've watched that show, but like I feel so old watching it because I'm like, oh my god, that all the music choices. Um, speaking of social media, um, the there are moments in the film where there is the the Twitter uh, sound effect. And I assumed that that meant that that was a moment that Zola tweeted about in that 148 tweet thread. And I was, I was hoping, I, I, I can't be the first person to call that out. Um, call that out. Um, Everybody gets it. So I'm always impressed when someone does. I'm like, oh yes. It's, it I told him that, I, I did tell him that. <laughs> Yeah, I told him that. Shit. Don't listen to him. <laughs> but but I, I do feel like I didn't hear the sound effect 148 times, which means I'm assuming that it, you didn't use it. So I'm sort of curious, what's the difference between a, a tweet that you wanted to to use for a moment like that and one that you sort of went like, well, we don't really need to use that? Uh, the, the whistle, the Twitter whistle, this was also written into our original screenplay. Uh, is meant to be when a line of dialogue is exactly as mm. tweeted. So if it is verbatim the tweet, that's when we use the whistle. So we don't use all 148 of them because sure. some of them- That'd are, be a lot. Well, some of them are also expositional, right? Like yeah. they're just not, yeah. they don't exactly work as lines of dialogue. So whenever there's a line of dialogue, that's exactly that. And I would say mostly everyone that's in the movie is accounted for. There are a couple- that I took the liberty of removing just because they were like wedged into points of high stress. And so hearing a whistle was like, what's that? Why? It just <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit. Um, so I, I kept it where not only we could homage the original text, but also where it wasn't getting in the way of the scene. That sound gives me agitation. Like, I feel like, like I need to check my phone. <laughs> <laughs> like no, you, you do. There's like, there was a version um, when I saw, when we played, I think the first or the second time we watched the movie with an audience, um, there used to be, it's not in the movie now, but there used to be um, this really large volume button. There is one now, it's a tiny one, but there used to be a big volume button in the middle of the screen. And the three times that we played it, I ended up taking it out because everyone in the audience like went and touched their phones, but they were watching a movie and I was like, <laughs> it's working, but we need to go back on it. <laughs> working too well. Yeah. I was like, they're actually missing a thing yeah. that we need them to look at. Um, so we ended up like, we just did reduced it a little bit, but I think 
we are so tethered to our phones and these four characters are are very much a product of cell phone culture mm-hmm. internet culture and and so in composing not only our score but in composing the world and how the world sounds the environment i wanted there to be these sounds that we become so accustomed to which you know a twitter whistle i hear a twitter whistle now and i i i just think i always think of the movie only because like i've spent so much time like <laughs> and i'm like oh Zola. you know even if it's yeah. my phone i just think that and yeah. because it's almost pavlovian right like these sounds are now just a part of how we live in the world yep very true um i'm going to give you a chance to to rave about taylor uh in particular because I, I, you know i brought up the narration earlier what i wanted to build off of is is just how extremely expressive she is uh with her facial ex- facial expressions um, okay. and how even without the narration she conveys so much um about what we're supposed to be feeling in certain scenes uh tell me about how what you think about you know capturing her in close up and her just being able to communicate as much as she does i mean taylor is is so brilliant you know i think that when we first started working on it there there was i feel this pressure for her especially playing in scenes with riley and riley was so big and so theatrical where i think she questioned if she if she needed to match her right And that goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning of like, you know, this is, let's look at classic comedy characters. There's going to be an alpha, there's going to be a beta, there's going to be the buffoon and there's going to be the straight man and you're the straight man. And I know sometimes it feels like you're not doing it right because everyone, when we call cut is laughing at the clown, but the clown works because you're in opposition of the clown actually, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. the, the laughter isn't just, the, isn't just like what we believe is delivering the joke, isn't just the slipping on the banana peel. It is actually like the thing that's next to it that mm-hmm. also creates that, right? It's like, a, I don't know, there's some physics there or some chemistry that happens that creates the the, the boom. Sure. Um, we talked about that character being sort of like a, a silent film heroine, right? And as busy or loud or chaotic as the whole world is or might be, we should always be able to look to her and know exactly where we are. Mm -hmm. There was a thought of, you know, if you muted the film, if you walked into the film and you couldn't hear it, you would still understand where we were at. And you would always understand that she was the heart or she was the center. Oh, wow. Else felt so untethered, but Mm. she was so grounded. And oftentimes physically, even in our blocking, she was just to the right or just to the left of the insanity or the madness, right? Wow, that's cool. Uh, You know, I did what I think many people are going to do when they're done seeing this movie, which is immediately grab their phone and go, okay, I got to read up on this. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I read, you know, a Rolling Stone article, a Washington Post, and, and I think it was Washington Post that said, look, we we fact checked those 148 tweets. And for the most part, like it all it all checks out like we all think it happened. They did say there are a few beats that they didn't say didn't happen. They just said that we could not confirm. Um, and, but there's some big beats. And so I'm sort of curious as the storyteller, as someone who had access to Zola, the decision of putting a plot point in the movie where like you're not sure whether or not it happened does zola still stand by yes this is a thing that happened and sort of where you come to terms on that you know i wanted to adapt the twitter thread Mm -hmm. and i'm a theater student like i said before were i to adapt ibsen chekhov strindberg shakespeare you treat the text as bible the text is totally sacred And so I was adapting a Twitter thread. I was not approaching this like a journalist and it wasn't a documentary. Uh, Fact checking wasn't a part of of my storytelling Mm -hmm. because I was treating what was presented, what I read as as sort of biblical, right? Sure. The story that I told is as presented in those 148 tweets. Fair enough. Um, Janik, so we have one other co-host uh, who couldn't be here, but he did the press day earlier. He was able to do the TV slots and then had to be someplace else. And he is obsessed with film stock and whether things are shot in 35 uh, or 16. And he picked up a story from earlier today that I would like you to expand on. Did you pay for your own 16 millimeter film stock? Did you have to pay out of your own pocket in order to? I'm I'm curious about this story. I like it. Um, Oh. (laughs) No, I did not pay for it. Um, 
I think that that was one of my tools that I used so that I could get it. That that was definitely a move that I used because I really wanted it. I really wanted us to shoot on 16. Mm -hmm. Uh, 16 is, you know, shooting on film in general is so generous. It's so generous to skin and body and and the actresses in particular are in vulnerable uh, positions and situations, even though you're not seeing their naked bodies, we're seeing so much of their bodies. And I wanted the romance that you get inherently just from shooting on film, that grain, Oh. is very kind, you know? And not only that, when getting a shoot on film, uh, I've only been able to do that one other time, but when getting to do that, there is something that happens on the set. There is an, a, an importance that happens and, uh, and a seriousness that comes with making because at the end of the day, there is a tangible object to the work that we did. And there's also something very fragile of whether or not it happened, right? Like, did it actually record what we'll right. see? Uh, and that's guess, terrifying, though. Isn't that terrifying? No, it's not. I mean, the whole thing is scary, right? Like every aspect right. of making is scary, and it, every a- aspect of it feels sort of like accidental, and that it even comes together is sort of a miracle. Um, no, I trusted it, and that's not to say it always worked. You know, there's definitely like. Shit, we don't have any coverage of Taylor in this scene because all of it is out of focus and there's nothing to be done because we're in Los Angeles now. Wow. Okay, well, how do we get there? Uh, but that didn't happen that much. And, you know, were we a larger film, we would have had the opportunity to go and reshoot. But uh, it's all a part of the big lesson of having worked on the movie. And, um, and it was really magical in the end. That's amazing. Um, so I, I've, I've been doing interviews for a long time and I can promise you the next question I'm about to ask you, in no way have I ever asked a variation of this question ever in my entire career. Um, so I would like to talk about the montage of dicks and just sort of about like- You've never asked about dicks. I've, I, it has never come up. He's lying, um, he asks about it in every interview. Yeah. Every interview. <laughs> every time. Disney gets, yeah. Disney gets really upset about it. Um, so, just just from a filmmaking perspective, just like the audition process, like the like the like the conversations with the actors ahead of time, like I'm assuming that like, like the you have to light it just as well as you would light any other type of shot, and sort of like the process of it, and just like how it how that differs from a different shot that you would have like in the day. Um, I didn't audition penises, but great question. Uh, <laughs> My mom's never listening to this episode ever. Um, it was, it was again, it was written into the the script. There is a footnote that says there'll be no female nudity in this movie. There will only be penises. This is a montage of penises. And then, you know, it's like written in. Uh, I think that everyone knew that, but then we were actually there. And I think that we still didn't know that. And I kept, we had a local casting director. Um, I think she actually had worked on Spring Breakers, our local person. And, um, you know, I was like, we got to find these penises. Uh, it needs to feel like an innumerable amount of penises. And she was like, okay. And she was auditioning actors and they weren't comfortable with nudity uh, naturally, which is not rare. And I had had the idea because I had researched that Tampa had the third largest nudist population. Uh, I think in the world, maybe in the country, but I believe in the world. And so I'd had the idea that we should go to a nudist community and just find out if there were men there who wanted to be actors. And so she went to one, found a couple people and they were totally into it. And then a couple people were like, oh, my friend and another person suggested their friend. And so we ended up with like a list of 10 to 12 men. And, uh, and then I got this email with no, there were nothing to preface this email. I was on set and I get this email and then suddenly someone comes running in because I guess it's like an HR thing. They're like, I need to tell you that there are dicks in the email. And I was like, huh? Because it was really open and I'm just on set and there were (laughs) photos of people's penises. And I was like, I'm not casting penises. I just wanted to see people's faces. I literally asked to just see pictures because Riley had to be in scene with the actors, right? And so I was going to, of the 15 we were going to narrow it down to like eight or nine and then i was going to talk to them and if anybody was scary then we were going to cut from that so what there was though were all these photos of men's penises and i was just like guys i 
I'm not comfortable, but I thought it was really funny. And I'm sure it's the only time this will ever happen to me. Uh, so that's the casting process. So we narrowed it down to about, I think nine or 10 men. Uh, I had an hour long conversation with each of them. I told them about the movie. I told them about my intention. I talked to them about how I wanted to photograph it. Um, and from that eight or nine, I, I think I narrowed to six and then they came to set and we like together, all seven of us in a room, we talked through it. We went to set. I was like, we walked through the motions. We met the cinematographer. We met everyone that was going to be in the room. Um, which was myself, my AD, my cinematographer, sound. Um, and I think that was it. I think there were only four, and Riley, and Riley was there. Sure. And so they met all of us, and um, and then we just did it. What's funny is that most of the men, of the six of them, four, four, about four of them had said that the nudity actually wasn't the thing that was scary. It was acting. The acting was actually the part that was scary. Oh, wow. Um, and... And funnily enough, I mean, I think for many of us, it would probably be the opposite. Exposing yeah. ourselves would be scary. But they were living in communities where they felt very comfortable in their bodies. Amazing. Wow. Um, by no means did we want that to be our final question, but we are getting... We're getting close on this. I get it. That's what you guys want. And here that, we are, guys. That is our, it's our yeah. brand. That's our podcast brand. Yeah. We close on dicks. Yeah. But we uh, love the movie so much. We cannot much. thank you enough for joining yeah. us. Yeah, we're thank huge fans. Thank, thank you. Yeah. And continued success with it. Yeah. Thank you very much. You guys have a nice day. Obviously, we want to thank A24 and, of course, Janixa Bravo for joining the Real Blend podcast. Make sure you guys see Zola when it comes to theaters on June 30th. It is absolutely something you guys need to check out. Uh, really great film. And, a, again, I think the announcement of a really exciting storyteller will continue to track her progress. I also want to point out the fact that if you missed it on the main show tease, uh, I want to talk a bit about a cool event that we have coming up on Tuesday, the 29th, <clears throat> excuse me, we are going out to Los Angeles. The Real Blend Boys are going to be together for the very first time. Uh, and we are going to be helping our friend, Quentin Tarantino, friend of the show, uh, who's been on twice before. He has a book launch. Um, oh, I have the book <clears throat> somewhere here for people who are doing this on video. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He's launching that book on Tuesday the 29th, and then we are going to be recording a live two-hour event uh, in L.A. with Quentin as our guest. It's going to be broadcast from the uh, New Beverly, but um, we're going to be recording it and then being able to put it on our uh, streams. So you'll hear the audio version on all the places where you get the Real Blend podcast. We'll have a, an audio version that's going on the YouTube uh, channel. It'll drop eventually. We're probably going to be putting it out the week after we record the show. Unfortunately, uh, for people who are in Los Angeles, the tickets to the uh, live event have sold out already. They went really, really quickly. But you'll be able to hear the entire interview, the full two hours of us with Quentin Tarantino, as soon as we're able to put it together and process it and put it on our podcast feeds. Something we are very, very excited about. We've been trying to get out to Los Angeles. This opportunity sort of presented itself with Quentin having his book coming out. It's just something we couldn't pass up on. So uh, track us on our socials. We'll be you know, posting a bunch of different things as we go through all of next week recording uh, with Quentin and the show and then we'll have the full two hours up for you guys to listen to in its entirety thank you guys so much for everything you do for the show uh, we really appreciate all the support from the blenders out there and we'll be back with a new episode very soon